Our next speaker is, uh, is Michael Wu, who is from Lithium Technologies, which uh, has to, has to uh, thread a very difficult social problem, which is creating a social loop between the company and its customers. For those of you who you've now heard three presentations and you're hitting fatigue, why you should listen, Michael is about as certified in terms of credentials as a smart person as you can get. He is a PhD. He has a he has a triple uh, he is a, a triple major in applied math, physics, and molecular and cell biology from UC Berkeley, and his title is principal scientist analytics. So you're going to be learning something from him, Michael. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. So um, today I'm going to talk to you about the magic potion behind gamification. So this is part of a two-hour workshop, and it's shrinked down to 15 minutes. So forgive me if I speak a little fast. Um, so we've seen many examples of gamification last day, right? Anything from um, potty training to terrorists, um, right? But all the common themes in, among all this gamification is that they drive a change in human behavior. Right? They, they, they make us do something that we don't normally do. Right? So, um, so what's behind? What's the, ma what's the magic behind gamification? Right? A lot of it has to do with you know, the game mechanics and game dynamic that we use. Right? And there are actually many of them. You probably are familiar with some of the you know, appointments and, and stuff. Um, that's pretty popular out there. But there are new ones created every day. Right? And as a scientist, I have to say, well, why? I mean, what give these game mechanics or game dynamic is magical power that make us do something that we normally don't do. Okay, so um, to do this, uh, we could take a perspective from a, a behavioral psychologist and, and analyze this problem from a psychological pr perspective. And um, I'm going to introduce a, a behavioral model introduced by Professor B.J. Falk at Stanford. Um, uh, Falk basically claims that you know underlying every human behavior, there's there's three factors. Okay. There's motivation, there's ability, and there's a trigger. And motivation just means people want to do it, right? Ability means he, he can do it, and trigger means he's told to do it, all right? And the interesting thing about this model is not about these three factors, okay? It's not about these three factors, I repeat, okay? It's, it's the fact that these three factors have to converge at the same time, okay? When you have these three factors converge all happening at the same time, that's what drives action, okay? So, Gamification, all the game mechanics and game dynamics, all they're trying to do is basically drive a user up to the upper right-hand corner, and then you trigger them. Right? OK? Very simple. Right? And there's, there's actually many, many different ways to get a user to the upper right-hand corner. Right? You, if, if you have the ability, but you don't have the motivation, you go that way. If you have the motivation, but don't have the ability, you go a different way. Right? And uh, for most uh, uh, gamification application, people sort of already have the ability to do something, and you're just trying to motivate them. So the trajectory, somewhat, the behavior trajectory looks somewhat like this. Okay. Now, there's also a activation threshold, and the trick is that you want to get people above the activation threshold before you trigger them. Right? If you trigger them before the activation threshold, no actions happen. Right? If you trigger, you have to trigger them after they reach that uh, above that uh, activation threshold. All right. Now. So let's look at the first factor, motivation. Right? What motivates people? Right? And there's actually many, many, many theories out there, including like there's like probably 50 of them. I don't have time to go through all of them. So I'm going to only tell you about three of them. Okay? Uh, so first one is Abraham Maslow's hierarchy. And you've probably all seen this. right? So basically, you know, um, it starts from the lowest level called the physical, um, the lowest four level, he called them um, the deficiency needs. And these are the lowest level, essentially food and water, and you know, safety are security and money, right? So, I mean, we don't play games for food and water anymore because those are pretty much satisfying the modern society. But in um, ancient time, yeah, cavemen sort of you know, play for food and water, right? And nowadays we play for money, and some still, we still play for money. But as these things are more and more satisfied. We're going to move up the, the chain and start playing for social cohesion, you know, uh, the community, sense of belonging, and more and more for status, achievement, and reputation. And guess what? These are really just game dynamics and game mechanics. 
right, that you see I show in this first slide, okay? So now you say, well, what is this self-actualization actualization thing on the top there? Well, um, uh, Marshall calls this like meta needs because they're not like, you know, uh, they're different from deficiency needs in the way that they, they can be depleted, okay? There's something intrinsic. And if you look at Marshall's work a little more carefully, they are, there's actually a, a whole lot of these meta motivators that he called, okay? Act, um, and so this, these include like, you know, these uh, harmony, uniqueness, creativity, spontaneity. These like the, the I, ideal human kind of quality that, that, that drive human behavior intrinsically, all right? And if you think Marshall is kind of old school, right, 1943, guess what, you know? Dan Pink has recently written a, a New York Times bestseller, Drive. Everybody seen this book? A lot of people have read this, right? He basically took three of the factors from uh, Marshall's uh, uh, mot meta motivator there and, and distilled them down to three. Basically, autonomy, mastery, and purpose, right? And guess what? Autonomy is, is an, a set of other game mechanics, right? Ownership, blissful productivity, and serendipity. And mastery, again, more game mechanics and game dynamics. And purpose is just you know, meaning and quest and discovery and all that stuff, right? They're just game mechanics. All right. Now, uh, you heard Skinner, right? So, uh, so that's, Skinner is a, is a very radical, uh, um, uh, has proposed a very radical uh, um, idea. It's that basically, he ignores all these intrinsic needs. He said, well, everything is learned and, and, and conditioned and reinforced, right? And typically, in a game, 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 uh, gamification application, uh, the reinforcer is typically some kind of a point, and they could be learned over, over time and become the motivator itself, right? And, but the interesting thing is that points are actually not motivating. If I give you a point, you know, every second, it's not motivating at all, right? So the, the key comes down to how to use these um, uh, points is it's a reward schedule, right? It's how you give this point, when you give them, how many do you give them, and precisely at what frequency will you give them, right? And this is very often used in the progression dynamic and level up dynamics as well. All right, now, the uh, last one I'm gonna talk about is Mihai, Chixen Mihai, okay? So um, that's the idea of flow. Uh, you heard this before. So everybody know about flow? Most people do, probably, right? So flow is this, this mental state that you are sort of totally immersed in what you do, and you, you're, you're good at that, and you, you feel great. You kind of forget about food, and, and you forget about hunger, you forget about tiredness. When I'm solving a really math, difficult math problem, I often go into flow, okay? Because and Chick and Mihai also characterize the condition that's necessary to go into flow is that your the skill, that, uh, that, sorry, the challenge that you face has to match a skill that you have, right? If it's, if it's a little bit kind of, it's, it's too challenging, then you get worried, you get anxious, right? Uh, if this, the, the task is like too easy, then you get bored, right? And you, you don't want that either. Um, so, and, and so flow is somewhat kind of in this kind of fine line between like control and also boredom, right? We love to be in, in, in sort of in control of things, but if things get too much in control, then we, we kind of feel it's bored. It, it's, it's not interesting anymore, right? So, um, so likewise for arousal and worry, right? So one of the interesting things about flow is that like, over time, people acquire skill, right? Their skill increases over time, right? And that's why game mechanics is usually not enough. You need like game dynamic in some way, right? So, so tip, since we are motivated by challenges, interesting thing, and, and variety and new things, um, we pick a task that's more challenging, right? And, and if we pick it right, then we'll move back into flow. But in reality, in real life, at workplaces, it's really hard to pick a task that's just right to move us back to flow. Usually, we pick a task that's either too easy, and yeah, so it still looks kind of boring, right? Or they're maybe a little too hard, right? So if it's like this, just a little bit too hard, then it's probably okay. Because we, you know, we can just have to learn a little bit of stuff, learn a little, acquire a little more skill, then we quickly move back to flow. But typically in the world, what would happen is that we pick a task that's way too hard, or you've been assigned to a task that's way too hard, right? So you have to have this steep learning curve before you get back to the flow, all right? That's why uh, good gamification and game dynamic have to adapt and evolve with the player, okay? All right. So, uh, so that's the first factor. I, I, like I said, there's like many, many motivation theories out there. You know, self-efficacy theory, cognitive dissonance, um, self, I mean, there's a lot. Okay? I, I don't have time to go through them all. So the second perspective is ability. 
the second factor, right? In this perspective, uh, there's actually two uh, ways to look at the problem. Is that like you look at it from the user's perspective is his ability, but if you look at it from the task that he needs to complete, it's really simplicity, and that's perceptual, okay? Because people will actually do things that they perceive simple, right? Um, so basically, there's two ways to move a user above and beyond this activation threshold. Right? And you can do it the hard way or the easy way. Right? The hard way is that you can actually increase his real ability to motivate him to practice and train. Right? For example, like I play badminton, and I, I'm not very good at that. My wife always beats me. So um, I'm motivated to, to, to practice and get better because I want to beat her. Right? So um, I want to beat her in badminton. Okay? I don't want to beat my wife. So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, or you could do the easy way, right? You can make the task appear simpler, perceive simpler, than the user would, would tend to do the task, right? So yesterday we talked about like, you know, why doesn't a, a, a manager write a performance review? Because he doesn't remember. You know, he, it's, it's, not, it's not easy for him, right? So he thinks that it's a really difficult task. So, um, so next question I want to ask is, what is simplicity? So simplicity is one of those things that we all sort of have an idea what it is, but it's often very, very hard to quantify and, and, and actually uh, define and, and measure, okay? So um, I'm gonna show you, this, it's a simple way to measure simplicity, quantify simplicity is, to, simplicity is really a measure of access to certain resources. And there's three main categories of resources that you need to perform the task at the time when you need to, uh, at the time when you need to perform a task. So the first is effort resource. Right? So physical, anything that requires a lot of physical effort and mental re, uh, effort, um, it becomes not simple anymore. Right? If you guys all have to solve a, a, math, a difficult math problem before you could come to this conference, most of you probably won't come. Right? So, or if it costs a lot of money, right, then you won't come. Right? Um, so scarce resource is another, uh, another uh, resource that's uh, very often limited. It's, so time is, is usually the, the one that we're most familiar with, right? A lot of, lot of, st lot of times we don't do certain things is because we don't have time, right? Not because we can't do them, right? So simplicity it has nothing to do with skill, okay? It's the, it has to do with the access to the resource needed to complete a task, right? If you don't have the, the resource, then it's not simple, okay? All right, and also the last uh, category is, adapt I call these adaptability resources. They're essentially the capacity to break norms, right? So essentially, uh, you know, uh, as an Asian uh, growing up in, in uh, Taiwan, I, I don't talk back to my parents, right? So if I talk back, it's something that requires me to kind of challenge my authority, then that becomes not simple to me anymore, right? So, okay, so, um, so that's simplicity, but uh, simplicity also depends on certain context, right? So it depends on individual. Right? So for young people, they have a lot of time, but they don't have a lot of money. Right? So that's, you know, different people have access to different resources. That's, that's pretty obvious, right? But, but these uh, resources can be gained and lost over time too, right? So tweeting, everybody can tweet, right? I can tweet, but I cannot tweet now because I, don't, I lost that access to time right now because I'm talking, right? So, um, so it depends on time and, 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 and context. And, um, so uh, these resources can also be traded off, right? Time and money, everybody knows about that, right? But uh, at the really extreme, motivation and ability can also trade off too, right? Like I said, you know, like if, if, every, if I make this uh, conference uh, uh, cost like twice as much, right? It requires more resource from you to come, then maybe less of you will come. But if I also make this uh, conference, um, okay, so I, I kind of don't have a lot of time. So, uh, so next is, uh, so that's simplicity, but what is perceived simplicity, right? Perceived simplicity is something that if you, if you think it's actually harder than, than, than it is, then uh, you will uh, tend to uh, do the thing that, that, uh, that you are gamified to do. Okay, so um, some of the game mechanics that's used are some of these uh, cascading information theory. These are common, right, that you've seen them all over, again, over and over again. So the last factor is trigger, okay? So something, trigger is basically something that asks a trigger to take action. And the key thing is that the user must be aware of the trigger and understand what it means. That's the only important thing. And it can be, it can be in any form. It can be a, a ring in the cell phone or a flash in the screen or anything. Um, and trig, why is trigger necessary? You know, sometimes you ask, like, if I have the motivation and the ability, isn't that enough, right? It's, 
not enough because typically, you know, people are not aware of the ability, right? And that's the case, you know, where um, you don't know how simple the task is. And some people may be hesitant. They question their motivation, right? And they may be distracted. They may be engaged in a different task that uh, they're not uh, doing. Uh, so a trigger serves to kind of reassure their, uh, their uh, motivation and bring to the awareness of their ability and also break these kind of routines that they're engaged in, right? So for example, exercise, right? They want to, we all know we should exercise. We can exercise, but we don't exercise because we are busy or whatever. So, um, so trigger also depends on the tra behavioral trajectory, right? So um, if you have the ability and don't, not motivate it, you use something called a spark trigger, right? So th typically, this is built into the motivation system. And I'll show you an example of that. And if you motivate it by lack of ability, then you use something facilitator. That tend to s illustrate or highlight the simplicity of the task. And uh, the last one is if you have uh, motivation and ability, then you should just use a signal um, um, motivator. Um, Sorry, sorry, signal trigger. Essentially, it should serve just as a reminder, and that, that's, that's all it should do. Right? If you make it simpler, it actually will seem boring. If you try to motivate you too much, it actually will be annoying. And um, so, trigger actually also depends on uh, personality, gaming personality, right? So, you've seen all these four types. So, to, motiv to trigger a killer is to challenge them, right? You've just been oust, right? And to um, trigger a socializer, right, is totally different. You tell them that, hey, 21 of your friends are doing this, why don't you come join them, right? right? An achiever, you want to, they're driven by special things, right? Unique special uh, perks and, and status and special access. So an explorer is driven by uniqueness of their contribution, so you call upon their uniqueness uh, capability, right? So, um, so that's, um, that's that, and trigger is all about timing, right? So it's a poorly timed trigger are like spam mails and pop-ups, right? We know what they are, and we know what they mean, we're aware of them, but they come in a time when we don't have the motivation and don't have the ability. Don't have ability meaning I don't have time to look at it, right? So, um, so once we understand. Wait, Michael, unfortunately, Sorry. we're past time. So can okay. you just very quickly yes. summarize this? Yes, this is uh, the last two slides. Okay. So what we get here is we get an evaluative framework and a design paradigm, right? So um, if we know why gamification works, then we can evaluate the effectiveness of gamification strategy, future gamification strategy, right? So we all know this example, right, from yesterday, right? So what is the, the behavior that we're trying to gamify? Drive slower, right? So do they have the motivation? Sure, win money, right? Does the user have the ability to do it? S certainly, they're driving, right? So they can certainly slow down the car. And do, does that trigger? Yes, because that's, you know, this is a case where that, you know, there's the lottery, you know, the sign and the, fix, and the camera fixture serve as a, a, a trigger as well because, and this is a spark trigger, this, because this is the case where people have the ability and not motivated to drive slow, okay? All right, and not only that, we get um, uh, also a kind of a, a design paradigm. We could just, you know, it's all about like driving uh, the temporal convergence of these three factors. So the, the magic formula behind gamification is really, you know, to place the proper trigger in the behavior trajectory of motivated players at the moment when they feel the greatest excess in their ability. So. <laughs> Sorry for my... Uh... Thank you. The question everybody is dying to know in the audience, have you started beating your wife? No, I have not. <laughs> uh, more seriously... <laughs> at, uh, by the way, at badminton, just in case there was any doubt in the audience. Anyway, uh, you mentioned on, on any of the slides the activity threshold, and it sounds like it sounds like one of the things that is a tool that we have to do is figuring out what that activity threshold is. In most cases, we start by assuming that it's the ability to pull out a credit card and play money, but as we get to more sophisticated games. So I assume that actually understanding that and sorting it out is one of the key things that you would have examined if we had more than 15 minutes. Yes, uh, that's where the analytics comes in. So uh, gamification is actually a, a heavily depend on on metrics and, and, and analytics, you know, and that's something that uh, will probably require an hour by itself.